I'm Richard Weiss. I'm the Dean of the Seminary here at United Theological Seminary, and it is my honor and my delight to welcome you to United Seminary, to the Bigelow Chapel, and to the 15th Annual Multicultural Lectures of the Seminary. For those of you who are not familiar with United, we are one of the seven seminaries of the United Church of Christ, but we were founded by the United Church of Christ to be an ecumenical seminary, and so we are. We train men and women for leadership in church and society from over 20 different denominations and faith traditions. Along the way, we have learned that different points of view are one of the most powerful educational tools on the planet and students learn how to do, be better leaders in their own tradition by bumping up against people from other traditions. And we've also learned that that has tr is true not just for faith traditions, but for cultural traditions and histories of all the different peoples among whom the Christian faith has taken root and all the different ways that the gospel has been given flesh and blood in different cultures, which is the root and the reason why we offer these multicultural lectures every year, because there are parts of the church from which we all have much to learn. And so it's my pleasure to welcome you to these tonight. Before I introduce Professor Caputz, who will introduce our speaker, I want to be sure to acknowledge our multicultural coordinator, Ms. Marguerite Levy, who's the organizing force behind this whole event. So, thank you, Marguerite. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Paul Caputz, Professor of Historical Theology, who will introduce this year's lecturer. Thanks, Rich, and welcome to everyone. It's good to see you all here tonight. I'm overjoyed. That's not an exaggeration. I am overjoyed to welcome to this podium Matthew Johnson to be this year's multicultural lecturer. Matthew and I were students together at the University of Chicago Divinity School 25, 20 years ago, however, a long time ago. <laughs> we both did our doctorates there. The University of Chicago, as you probably know, is uh, judged by impartial observers to be perhaps the finest university in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and Matthew and I certainly feel that way whether it's objective and impartial or not. And fortuitously, I ran, Matthew and I ran into each other in Atlanta at the American Academy of Religion meeting uh, this fall. And he encouraged me to buy his book, which I did, The Tragic Vision of African American Religion. And I've been given the honor of reviewing it for the Journal of the Society of Christian Ethics. And I have to say it's one of the most intellectually stimulating and challenging books I've read in a long time. Matthew combines his background in philosophical theology, having studied with David Tracy and Langdon Gilkey at Chicago, with studies in psychology, specifically psychoanalysis. He's done postgraduate training in psychoanalysis. He's interested in the meaning of tragedy, both as a literary genre and the tragic religious vision that underlies and precedes tragedy as a literary genre. He's interested in trauma theory and how the African-American historical experience has been one of trauma and therefore the appropriateness of both a tragic theological vision to articulate that experience as well as the application of psychoanalytic categories. Matthew is one of those few theologians who reaches beyond narrow disciplinary confines to engage in a broad conversation with many disciplines, with many communities, 
though I think it's fair to say that was typical of the kind of education we received at the University of Chicago. Matthew is a Baptist minister. He's founded the Church of the Good Shepherd in Atlanta, where he's uh, currently the pastor, though he has taught at Morehouse College and Spelman College. Many of you know that our former colleague Rosetta Ross went down to Spelman, and so he, we have that connection between us. Uh, Matthew told me not to go on and on and on uh, with some kind of uh, tremendous introduction, so I think he's right. I think uh, I'll let his lecture speak for itself, but I'm, I'm very grateful that you all turned out tonight. I think these are going to be a, a, a wonderful uh, series of lectures, and um, Matthew, I just want to express my deep gratitude and, and exhilaration that you're here, and um, just take it away, all right? I want to thank Paul for the very gracious uh, introduction and welcome. By way of introduction, I do feel more at home now, in spite of the fact that it was 80, over 80 degrees in Atlanta when I left. <laughs> and I experienced something of a traumatic shock when I arrived here <laughs> to see partially frozen lakes and feel the nip in the air. But uh, nevertheless, it's, a, it's wonderful to, to be here. And uh, I really want to give a special thanks uh, to Paul, but, but also Sister Marguerite Levy who has been talking to me about uh, coming and um, who made me feel really good about coming when she uh, first extended the invitation and the way that she has helped to host me while I'm here. Uh, I thank you, thank you publicly and to the Dean as well. Um, as Paul has uh, shared with you, my uh, inclination of course doing uh, theology is, is interdisciplinary and uh, consequently I have attempted to move methodologically beyond what I think are the narrow constraints of traditional methodology of black theology and uh, try to move deeper into the experience. And there's a real reason why black theology is talking about a church that we can hardly recognize at present with the emergence of certain um, new theological orientations in the African American church and across the evangelical spectrum, particularly with respect to prosperity theology and others. There's a reason why traditional African American or traditional black theology uh, can't get a grasp on what's happening in the church. And it's because as a, methodologically it's always been too far from the experience of the people to grasp the real consciousness of African-American Christianity, although it, it provides a great deal of insight um, and some normative challenges. Uh, but I think it is too methodologically thin to grasp and appreciate the experience in a way to articulate the depths, theological depths um, of the African-American uh, Christian tradition. And so um, some of us now are trying to move a little further into the experience and beyond the methodological constraints. And tonight I'm going to talk about how I'm thinking through that problematic and how it relates to rethinking some traditional uh, Christian categories. And also um, one of the other differences that while I speak out of the African-American experience, I see myself as speaking to the Christian church. I do not, um, one, a, 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 a submit to or think it's the bulk, current balkanization of discourses in the academy and certainly in the religious academy is healthy uh, for the church or, or for humankind. I, I think the, the, the rigid ontologization of uh, differences, uh, unfortunately, um, refracting what I think is uh, 
common human experience. And I think the African American tradition is too complex, too profound, too significant of instantiation of modernity and a response to its ills for what it has to contribute to be localized in the narrow frame of a particular people defined by an imposed um, definition and cultural taxonomy. Having said that, I want to speak with you this evening on the subject of the Middle Passage, trauma, and the tragic reimagination of African American theology. <clears throat> In recent years, research on the physical evolution of the universe has demonstrated that violent explosions, collisions, and catastrophes have played a key role in the evolution of the universe, in the emergence of life in our solar system. Prior to relatively recent developments, most scientists and others familiar with the data believe that the pace of evolutionary development was gradual that it entailed almost unimaginable stretches of uninterrupted time. We are now aware that the roles of sudden, immense, violent episodes in the evolutionary process were grossly underestimated. Darber and Muller, in their work of 1996, point out that this underestimation was due in large part to the rarity and magnitude of these events. In other words, there is really no experience available in our collective frame of reference that would make such large-scale, tumultuously violent uh, episodes imaginable. What experience do we have of violent cataclysms, what experience we do have, falls far too short of giving us the frame of reference we would need to imagine the magnitude of the Big Bang or the collision of the Earth and the asteroid that left its mark on the Yucatan Peninsula. We have been favored in the latter half of the 20th century, however, by the discovery of a crater in Mexico dating back approximately 65 million years to the time of the demise of the dinosaur and the discovery of the background static, referred to as the cosmic echo, reaching the Earth from all directions in the universe. Hence, however difficult it may be to imagine the violence of these two events, these discoveries, along with additional data, suggest that these events did actually occur. The cosmic echo still currently detectable indicates that the otherwise unimaginable Big Bang must have taken place. There has been an episodic but ongoing debate throughout American history about just what the peculiar institution slavery and its pernicious spawn, the Middle Passage and Jim Crow, means to African Americans and America in general. This debate has been largely historical, which given the nature of the case is understandable. But there is no doubt that we are still enmeshed in an ongoing historical reality that has largely been shaped by the forces that were configured and set loose during this critical period of American history. Current social reality, particularly for African Americans, but certainly for the larger American public as well, is still largely a consequence of the initial situation. This fact has char charged the examination of the period with so much contemporary political, cultural, and social meaning that the kind of sustained, objective, interdisciplinary analysis needed to really appreciate the nature of this multi-layered phenomena often gets sidetracked by the powerful political interests and the psychosocial dynamics involved. Nowhere has this been more apparent than in religious studies. In the study of African American religion, particularly that done by African Americans themselves, the impact registers in a defensive posture that inclines the discussion toward a premature moralization of extremely general, albeit emotionally potent and descriptively accurate categories, such as suffering, oppression, and hypocrisy. On the other hand, there are those who believe that there has been more than enough discussion of the institution of slavery and enough has been done to address the issue of race, or what W.E.B. Du Bois has called the color line. Still others take it a step further, arguing that in addition, there has been enough done to redress the situation, implying that if the situation has not been remedied by now, it is obvious the fault of African Americans, especially in view of their unprecedented access to political participation, educational opportunities, and the legal process. The reasoning again tends toward a distinctly moralistic path with a focal preoccupation on fault and blame, 
Any residual problems, in so much as there may be any, are primarily moral. That is to say, they can be overcome simply by making better life choices at individual levels. The assumption behind these views is, of course, that the situation has been properly analyzed and understood in the first place. How else could we determine that enough has been done to remedy a malady unless it is assumed that it has been thoroughly and properly diagnosed, and we have thoroughly understood the depth of the disease? I, however, do not believe that we have. Early consideration of the damaging effects of the institutionalized violence of the peculiar institution and Jim Crow and its thoroughly debilitating taxonomy reinforced by the rituals of daily interaction was precluded by a racist ideology designed to reinforce the legitimacy of slavery. Poussin and Alexander in their book on Lay My Burden Down point out, during the five decades before the Civil War, a time when the South depended on slave labor to sustain its place in the nation's burgeoning economy, the medical scientific community continued to provide, quote, expert opinion that blacks were inferior to whites by nearly every measure. Above all, blacks were portrayed as mentally inferior to whites, more akin to lower forms of hominids than to modern human beings. Concepts promulgated by some white doctors, researchers, and Christian leaders describe blacks in a taxonomy that was infantilizing and intellectually narrow. With few exceptions, blacks were said to be childlike, docile, superstitious, gifted, with preternatural strength, devoted to a strict but merciful God, and mostly complacent within their enslaved status. Happy-go-lucky in the face of unceasing hard labor, domestic servitude, and stinging cruelties such as whipping, sexual abuse, and lynching." Uh, end quote. African Americans were consistently portrayed as having very simple, intellectually oriented, uh, instinctually oriented natures and uncomplicated, and this is key, uncomplicated emotional and mental lives when functioning normally, and that elements of pathology were an indication of a morally degenerative racial tendency. African Americans were portrayed as simple and childish. The literature is replete with these characterizations. These assumptions, while not explicitly held, are still the operative assumptions of many European as well as African Americans when approaching the historical condition of African America and its historical struggle against the consequences of deeply embedded culturally ubiquitous racism. Just as human beings have a difficult time imagining the immensity of a catastrophic violence that occurred at the birth of a cosmos and continued episodically in the evolution of a physical universe, and as a result, consistently fail to evaluate the role of these kinds of events in the process, on a smaller but significant scale, we have had difficulty evaluating properly the world-destroying catastrophe of the Middle Passage, the largest modern forced migration, the dislocation-relocation trauma, and the subsequent and persistent marginalization of the African American in this country. This has led to a situation where there is consistent underestimation of the significance of the initial conditions for what we are experiencing now. These initial conditions have determined the evolutionary course of African American cultural consciousness, American racial consciousness, race relations, as well as the fragmented refractory American identity more broadly conceived. Anyone with the right conceptual tools can detect the background static the historical echo in the modern American cosmos coming from all directions in contemporary American life and culture that indicates the magnitude of the initial cataclysm and what was for the African and her progeny the catastrophic nature of the psycho-socio-cultural analog of the Big Bang and the first three minutes, which is in fact the Middle Passage. It is especially difficult for white Americans to recognize the depth, damage, and violence of a cataclysm because they have had little in their experience to provide for the facilitation of the understanding of the experience at an empathic level. Outside of the African American community, few other Americans, with perhaps the exception of Native Americans, have been directly impacted by an experience like being ripped from their land and violently torn from their world. Even those Native Americans that managed to survive the first and most sustained of the racially motivated holocausts of the modern West still remain to some extent on their own land. African Americans were ripped from their land and violently torn from their world, in essence having it shattered 
stacked like spoons in a stinking cargo hole and shipped across the Atlantic with untold millions murdered and destroyed in the process. Those that survived the voyage were systematically and brutally stripped of their culture and identity and then left unintegrated into any, in any meaningful sense, outcast and marginalized in a culture they were brought to as chattel. They were then forced to live and labor under the whip and the lash, the rope and the rifle, submit their bodies to various forms of sexual predation and exploitation, all with the depth of the horror left unplumbed and unacknowledged, and their humanity unrecognized. It was a trauma of disastrous proportions, the trauma sustained and perpetuated through institutionalized violence, systemic and systematic, chronic marginalization developed early into a traumatic field that exists with unbroken continuity to the present. The initial conditions referenced above determine the parameters of the development of African American consciousness and hence Christian consciousness into subjective reality, identity, and the texture of an emotionally complex psychic life. In other words, just the opposite of what it was assumed. It's even more complex because of the nature of the experience. And this, I'm saying, we need to rethink what African-American religion means in the light of this reality of trauma and trauma studies because that was the pervasive reality of African-American experience and has remained so, as you can see, the pervasive violence and the threat of violence that we suffer on a daily uh, a daily uh, basis in communities that have remained economically and politically and culturally under siege. Another significant cluster of dynamics that adds to the complexity of the overall situation, which must at least be mentioned, is what I consider to be the very sensitive, neurotic nature of white America's guilt. The fragility of the Euro-American identity and conscience and the inability as a community to negotiate responsibility in these matters. Although the absence of an analysis of these dynamics is a prohibitive factor in developing the kind of detached analysis needed to appreciate the full depth of the problem as it was and the malignant nature of what it has become, their articulation lay beyond the scope of this essay. The Middle Passage symbolizes the meaning of the American experience for the African American much in the same way that Ellis Island symbolizes the meaning of the American experience for voluntary immigrants. It is significant, however, that Ellis Island is a place a destination. The Middle Passage is not. It, on the other hand, is a journey, an odyssey fraught with peril and riddled with uncertainty. The immigrant began in full knowledge of where they were going. The African had no idea where or how they would end up. Indeed, the Atlantic Ocean and the trade routes along which the Africans were transported en route to the Americas served as a geographical constituents of the idea of the Middle Passage. Yet they can no more exhaust the meaning of the Middle Passage for African Americans or others of the African diaspora than the narrow strip of disputed land between New York and New Jersey can exhaust the meaning of Ellis Island to those Italian, German, Irish, and Jewish descent or more recent, rather quiet influx of uh, Eastern Europeans. The voluntary immigrant came to America with much of their culture intact. They preserved and used much of their native language, at least initially, their religious traditions and other practices. They created communities where interpersonal interaction was mediated by familiar forms that remained deeply embedded and readily available in everyday reality. Although many immigrants experienced hardship, discrimination, and frustration, these were experienced in a framework of self-determination with a cultural cushion of inherited practices and the relative privilege of European ancestry. These, the Africans, particularly in the United States, were largely deprived of these fundamental elements of meaningful human existence, except for perhaps some negligible residuals. The process of deprivation was essentially traumatic through violent and coercive means, not the least of which was capture, institutionalized terror and internment, forced transport, slave breaking, and the establishment of legal codes. The African was systematically traumatized, culturally raped, and deprived of the fundamental realities that render human existence stable and meaningful. At the individual level, the very realities of which the African was deprived would have provided some means of assimilating the traumatic experience, or at least a cushion that would have helped soften the blow of capture and lifelong imprisonment within the system of chattel slavery. One might reason that this softening may indeed have taken place, at the very least, in the instance of capture and the overall experience of first-generation Africans who were still familiar and psychically conversant with their traditional worldview. But to the contrary, 
The trauma of capture and the terror of transport were enough to pose such a fundamental challenge to the traditional West African worldview, which, like all traditional people's worldviews, are fundamentally tied to community, land, and language, that the failure or breakdown of the worldview resulted in the ex existential dysfunctionality, which became an additional component of the trauma itself. A worldview provides the framework through which individuals and groups assimilate their experiences. They are functional as long as the various experiences can be assimilated in meaningful ways. Worldviews are from time to time challenged with the advent of the novel or the other. A novel or challenging experience need not precipitate a crisis. The encounter with the novel may simply call for an adjustment. There is a dialectical relationship between historical change and worldview so that they constantly act back on one another, establishing a kind of living system integrity that is mediated by and reflected in lived experience. This living system integrity manifests itself in the health of the individual and the relative stability of the individual identity formation, as well as group identity. The level of living system integrity can be measured in inverse proportion to feelings of anime and alienation. It can be measured in direct proportion to feelings of being at home in the world or comfortable with oneself in situ. A person is at home in the world as long as they remain embedded in their worldview. The looser the fit between an individual or group and their worldview, the more vulnerable they become to stresses, additional traumas, bouts of depression, and debilitating anxiety. The combination between alienation and the advent of additional structures, stresses, traumas, and anxiety, depending upon their relative strengths, produces distress and dis-ease. In the case of the African American, one must add to this equation the presence of physical pain and hardship, which lent a terrible, tangible reality to the fundamental trauma and the persistent threat of non-being. Historical change produces disturbances of one's existential position and produces feelings of anime and alienation. These, in turn, necessitate creative or adaptive responses from the individual or group to make the adjustment that leads to the domestication of novel experiences with, of course, varying degrees of success. The prevailing worldview provides the resources, that is, the categories, symbols, myths, rites, rituals, and so forth, employed by the individual and or group to come to terms with the experience. Radical historical change or traumatic stresses and tests uh, the ego's adaptive and creative capacities and the flexibility of the particular worldview. If the change or trauma, and of course radical change can have a traumatic effect, if the change or trauma exceeds the capacity of either the individuals involved to respond adequately to the experience or the resources provided by the worldview to assimilate, domesticate, and hence tame the experience, or both, and the two are always dialectically related, the worldview becomes dysfunctional, even in its proper historical context. This dysfunction crystallizes in the individual subject as distress, to be uprooted and brutalized, however, produces a more intense and chronic form of shock where subsequent distress devolves into disease. When human beings are uprooted, as in the case of the Africans, their worldview is rendered inaccessible except in only marginal terms and in extreme ambiguity. This is not to say that certain memories and beliefs did not persist. Indeed, they did. But how trustworthy were they in the deeper sense? Their functionality was a system or worldview was tied to the essential elements of original land, practice, community, and language, which in fact had been obliterated in the passage and rendered thereby inaccessible. When experience is overwhelming enough to precipitate an existential crisis for those that have been socialized into a particular worldview, by virtue of that worldview's inability to tame or domesticate challenging experiences, assimilation, the entire framework becomes destabilized and increasing, increasingly entropic. The breakdown of the worldview brings with it the threat of meaninglessness, which is traumatic in itself. It also intensifies the susceptibility to further trauma, enhancing its devastating impact. Gradually, due to the process of acculturation and integration into mainstream American society, immigrants and their progeny traded many of their traditional cultural forms for those of the New World. 
This process carried with it none of the trauma of the forced relocation and the multi-layered oppression of chattel slavery or its racially charged aftermath. The immigrants assimilated the values and the ideals of the new land. Their stories became a part of a dominant ideology that shaped the American story of freedom, hope, and shared participation in boundless opportunity. Hence the meaning of Ellis Island, even the hardship incurred by many in the communities of voluntary immigrants must be understood as imbued with a sense of hope, freedom, and self-determination. Reaching a destination in the process of immigration meant a new beginning. At the same time, the retention of certain cultural realities, not to mention the possession of the most salient feature necessary for inclusion in the mainstream of American identity, whiteness, which in a very interesting paper published in the Harvard Review some years ago, where, where it sees whiteness as a property, is a, as, as, part, as property and inheritance, is a very fascinating, uh, well-written article. The name of the author escapes me. If I recall it, I'll, I'll give it to you. Huh? That's it. Yes, whiteness as property. Thank you, Cheryl Harris. Whiteness meant also a fundamental connection to their past. They were assimilated into a new place with a cultural milieu that provided a transitional space that facilitated a relatively healthy mourning process of their old one. The cultural discomfort and the pain of the mourning process were mitigated significantly by the fact that the old world was incorporated into the story of the new one. The positive incorporation of the old world or worlds into the story of the new one, a process facilitated by the fact that race, or more specifically whiteness, functioned as the key dynamic in the constitution of the American identity proper, provided affirmative resources and a transitional structure for the creation and sustenance of relatively healthy group and individual identity. Hence, the immigrants arrived in America. The ships that brought them here landed and docked at Ellis Island. The African and her progeny, on the other hand, remained, so to speak, on the water, chronically marginalized and out to sea. Ellis Island is a destination. The Middle Passage is a journey, which is, in the nature of the case, ongoing. It is a journey, moreover, of a peculiar kind. Africans arriving in the New World, already suffering from the debilitating effects of sustained trauma of transport, complicated by violent separation from family and community, and the shock of the threateningly unfamiliar, were subjected to additional trauma and extreme stresses in the experience of the auction block, further violent separation, slave breaking, sexual exploitation and abuse, and institutionalized violence to a degree that coercion defined and exhausted the quality of African American participation in the nomo generative hegemonic culture. The original condition sustained and perpetuated through systemic and systematic institutionalized violence, chronic marginalization, the sustained assault of the operative cultural taxonomy on the African American psyche, all of which persists with unbroken continuity into the present, has established and maintained a traumatic feel within the experience of the race. The prevalence of trauma in African American experience, epitomized and given polyvalent symbolization in the Middle Passage, calls for a radical reconsideration of the nature of African American experience and the evolution of African American cultural consciousness and subsequent artifacts like religious experience, particularly in light of the rich new material being produced in the study of post-traumatic and complex traumatic stress syndromes. The pervasive experience of trauma was the initial subjective, intersubjective condition that would determine the trajectory along which African American culture consciousness would evolve. To identify the traumatic experience of the African American as merely suffering in some amorphous sense tends to deflect reflection down a moralistic and in the case of the African American religious studies, a prematurely theological path. The nature of the subjective intersubjective experience, particularly in the initial conditions, must be subjected to a more thorough, systematic, interdisciplinary analysis, which would yield a thicker understanding and more detailed articulation of the African American's rich inner world. Such an analysis must begin with a thorough examination of the meaning of the Middle Passage. The meaning of the Middle Passage is essential and perhaps even pivotal for understanding African American experience in and of America, their culture, and specifically for this essay, the formation of African American Christian consciousness. As I have stated, the Middle Passage, unlike Ellis Island, is a journey and one that continues. Let's examine the metaphor. Now, the reason this is, is so important is because one of my experiences at the University of Chicago is that in the 
historians, the historians there, saw much of African American experience in Christian, Christianity as simply a bastardization of the evangelical experiences of whites. That somehow these two experiences were roughly the same experience. They emphasized they had same forms of expression. They often expressed themselves through the same hymns, as though the meaning of those words could possibly be the same. Now I've heard this theory over and over again and it struck me in graduate school and I set out to understand and examine if this was the case. I found out that this could not possibly be the case. Uh, Malcolm X was right when he said the logic of the oppressor is not the logic of the oppressed. What seems rational to the oppressor is not rational to the oppressed. What is reasonable to the oppressor is not reasonable to, be, to the oppressed. And when it becomes so, it is a pathological refraction. And I want to make that point that it's not only cross racial lines, but that pathological refraction also occurs across class lines. So it can happen from within the context and does happen of either black, white, or any other race. So that's something that you, you want to keep in mind um, so that it doesn't become um, too uh, black or white, so to speak. All right. <laughs> the, the meaning of the middle passage is essential and perhaps even pivotal for understanding African American experience in America and their culture. Okay. The African American in the middle passage was, is suspended between two worlds. One, the African, though recollected with varying degrees of clarity, and intensity at both the individual and collective levels ambiguously fades into the background. While the other distinct, distant vision America looms ambiguously in the foreground. African Americans were then and still today remain very much on the water. It is no wonder that religious symbols associated with the heavens play such a significant role in traditional African American Christian consciousness. For when adrift on great waters or on a journey in strange and uncharted seas, without the benefit of the cultural artifacts that facilitate navigation, the sky becomes the only point of stable contact, reliable means of navigation, or fixed reference point for a rough determination of location. Even more than this, the navigational method in the Middle Passage, where African American humanity is stripped of all the usual instruments that facilitate movement through life, is a kind of death reckoning which relativizes any fixed point in here and now by an essentially entropic encounter with nothingness. Under such conditions where there is no fixed point by which to locate in a world where everything is thrown into question, where desire opens into nothingness, coming to rest nowhere, the human spirit undergoes dissipation. It is an essentially entropic experience. African Americans appropriated the symbol of heaven, a place outside of the vagaries of temporality as the only stable reference point to mark their path on the waters. It counted and arrested the dissipation to which the human spirit is subject, where deepest desires and fundamental human aspirations have no place to rest. The symbol of heaven acted back on the African-American subject in a way that provided structure for the constitution of human subjectivity and the beginnings of a new selfhood in the absence of stable points of reference outside of religious experience. They knew they were somewhere between heaven and earth, but not quite located either place. Earth faded like Africa into the background, and heaven like the America in which they could not locate loomed in the foreground. They remained on the water, essentially out to sea, and trying to make heaven their home. The otherworldliness of African-American Christian consciousness, and this is where I dis disagree with the traditional uh, bifurcation of the black church into progressive and conservative um, um, institutions. I think that's, 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 that's um, misdirected. The otherworldliness of African-American Christian consciousness is an essentially reflexive dynamic and a commentary on the fundamental instability of modernity. It is a testimony to the resourcefulness of the human spirit in the face of the absolute threat of non-being. The African-American appropriation of the substance of biblical faith must be understood within this framework. The circumstances of the African-American introduction to America ensured their chronic marginalization and perhaps condemned them to remain forever at sea. Slave breaking practices, dispersion, and legal codes devastated any effectively coherent connection to their native culture, while these and other practices effectively barred them from meaningful integration or participation in the larger culture, both of which then will remain essentially ambiguous. 
The absence of substantial access to African beliefs and practices, combined with the absence of meaningful integration into the larger meaning of America, ensured their cultural isolation. And attested to with many people today who, for instance, want their America back. They seem to have lost it somewhere. I feel like Nietzsche's madman in his parable, The Death of God. They've lost their America like the madman lost their God. The social and cultural dynamics which sustained the peculiar institution and were deeply embedded in the routinized practices of daily life maintained a sustained assault that warred against any effort on the part of African Americans to land safely ashore in America. These dynamics reinforced a cultural taxonomy that defined African American being through the categorization black in ways consistent with their subjugation and infused the system with a terroristic totalizing dynamic which threatened to completely subsume African American humanity in the experience of the system. The cultural taxonomies, in effect, materialized in the daily reality of subjugation, lending them an all but overwhelming reality and the terrible force of brute fact. And if you want a, a good book that kind of lays out how this played itself out, um, uh, it's a book called uh, what is it? Scenes of Subjection by Hart. It's an excellent, it's a fantastic book. And she lays this out. I wasn't aware of that uh, book when I, when I wrote this. Any, any psychic, for want of a better term, um, any psychic, for want of a better term, one could say spiritual, resistant slaves and their progeny may have mustered against the prevailing text cultural taxonomy was met with daily re-entrenchment. So what I'm trying, want you to understand is the chronic nature of this ongoing psychic struggle. Because every time they, they, they mustered some resistance, daily it was reinforced by the rituals of interaction and therefore met by re-entrenchment. African Americans became chronically then, chronically marginalized as a result of their predicament. The chronic nature of the marginalization was the result of the institutionalization and the internalization of the conflict. The elements of the conflict were dynamic in nature, so there was some internalization, but it was inherently conflicted. There was first the necessity to locate where they were, which was a living and ongoing need of all humans. Secondly, there was the problematic nature of the prevailing cultural taxonomy that defined the reality and meaning of where they were and consequently who, or more accurately, what they were. That was present at the same time. Thirdly, there was basic affirmation of human dignity with its concomitant aspiration, better read as desire, which made the degree of surrender necessary in order to locate with any level of authentic existential comfort virtually impossible without the total vitiation of the human spirit. And there is, there is a tragic complex, another way of articulating the tragic structure. So that their humanity then became the one thing that ensured their distress. Because their humanity was the one thing that would not let them internalize enough of the cultural taxonomy in order to locate and feel at home in America. So their, their humanity necessitated remaining out to sea. If they wanted to land, they had to give up their humanity. They didn't have to stay out to sea. They took refuge in a God that they understood, loved, and affirmed their humanity. All right. Um, where am I here? I'm almost, uh, all right. This chronic marginalization also established the conditions of a chronic mourning process, which is why the mourning dimension is so prevalent in African-American music, R&B, the blues, uh, black folk preaching, what it is, it's basically a cry. What you see is sustained mourning because you have a chronic mourning process. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's looking right at you. There's not a lot of mystery to it, but you have a very painful experiences being articulated through a mourning process that then becomes adaptive in the sense that it begins to mirror the experience of the people so that they know they ain't crazy and they share a communal reality. By virtue of the, and, and, and in the book there's to follow, I'm gonna develop the whole concept of the mirror and empathy as it's developed in, in self psychology and uh, some of the research on um, uh, mirror neurons and so forth. Uh, um, uh, is, is, providing us with resources to rethink that. By virtue of the traumatic loss of land and culture and the subsequent disturbance of the image through a refractory cultural taxonomy that severely complicated its rehabilitation with no adequate replacement of a quote, loved object, reference to Freud, to which the appropriate feelings could be transferred, 
complicated by the ensuing rootlessness, combined with the debilitating impact of a sustained traumatic feel, a profound melancholia became a fundamental constituent of African American subjectivity. It thus betrayed its essential character as a product of modernity. See Ferguson, 1995, describing the whole process of modernity as primarily that of melancholia. Um, the correlation of melancholia and mourning seems justified by the general picture of the two conditions. Moreover, the exciting causes due to environmental influences are, so far as we can discern them at all, the same for both conditions. Mourning is regularly the reaction to loss of a loved person or the loss of some abstraction which has taken the place of one, such as one's country, liberty, ideal, and so on. You see the relevance to African Americans. And, so, and, and the only way you can say that this didn't happen is to say that they, they just, they're not like other people. So we're not gonna mourn it. We're not gonna lose everything and, and, and actually mourn it. We can lose everything and somehow still be happy. We can lose everything and not be integrated and somehow our pain should be minimal. The only way that you can operate on that assumption is to assume that their humanity is fundamentally of a different species. So if you give up that, you give up, if, once you give up that, you've got to rethink the whole condition of African Americans in America. Once you admit that their experience is in some sense a part of common human experience, there's another reason why I can't attest to the balkanization, because once you do that, you give way too much. But once you say that the experience is fundamentally, uh, structurally uh, the same as all other people, at that point, you have to rethink the whole thing then. Because there's no way somebody can come through what I just described and not be suffering very debilitating realities without there being some kind of media, fundamental revolutionary change. And God knows we have not had that in America. And uh, politics, modern politics have proven that. All right. All right. All right. All right, let me move on. All right, it thus betrayed its essential character as a product of modernity. African Americans could establish no more than, at best, a deeply conflicted, existentially inadequate identification with the land and culture in which they found themselves. Hence, Michelle Obama's statement that she finally can be proud of America. And then people want to act like her experience was supposed to be the same as all Americans. As if all Americans, excuse me? As Bill Yes, yeah, well, Bill O'Reilly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, <that's>, uh, <laughs> yeah. As, as, as if all Americans' experiences are the same, uh, but, but they're not. Uh, and sooner or later, in spite of Paul's best efforts, Onesimus has to be allowed to speak. <laughs> Which, by the way, is, uh, we have a book coming out with Fortress Press called uh, uh, Onesimus, Our Brother, and my article is Onesimus Speaks in that book. All right, the product of these dynamics was an African-American subjectivity that was profoundly complex and fragmented. So this shows up in the church, too. This is why you can't romanticize the black church as though it does not reflect the suffering, the pain, and the complexity of the people who make it up. Institutions are a reflection of the people who constitute them. So you just don't jump out of oppression and jump into the church, and then all of a sudden the church is going to fight oppression. That's, for, that's a romanticized view. It does not take into consideration the serious complexity of the church. That's why it looks like the church ran off the rails and went running down the track with this prosperity stuff, when in fact it's simply a manifestation of some very profound and complex psychosocial realities that have always been there. And we're going to talk about, more about that tomorrow. These larger sociocultural forces which constitute the historical conditions of African-American existence crystallized into an instantiation of a mournful interrogative state. That's key. Because that makes it essentially postmodern, which means that postmodern ain't so postmodern. Postmodern is just the underside of modernity. It's very misleading to call it postmodern because you haven't gotten away from modernity. Certain themes in modernity have just matured and then crystallized, you see. African American subjectivity is characterized by a fundamental lack or longing, which is, becomes a key theological um, uh, uh, category and a key theological category to rethink the Christian faith. Because we, got, we have to stop acting like all our problems got solved when Jesus got up. <laughs> we done had genocide, holocaust, um, we, uh, 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 two world wars. I mean, we, we, we still having genocide. Listen, we still suffering. This triumphalism is insane. It inspires this kind of pathogenic denial 
in Christian consciousness where we're supposed to act like Easter Sunday morning. See, we don't have no problems. It also works well class-wise for those who actually don't have many problems because they are harboring and hoarding all the resources and the wealth. So we have to... We have to dialectically unmask the ideological employment of those Christian categories, and I think that African American experience, as I'll point out here and then in my comments, helps us to do. Hence, authentic religious experience became a meaningfulization of question rather than a doctrinaire response. The meaningfulization of question, so that raising the question or raising questions became meaningful in itself, or being in a questioning state became meaningful, and that's what you hear in the longing, is the instantiation of the interrogative state, and consequently, uncertainty. These are the things that has to be uh, uh, unpacked when you begin to talk about African-American theology. These real, adaptive, challenging responses that challenge the normativity of certain interpretations of fundamental Christian categories, okay? Herein lies a fundamental constituent of its essentially tragic and profoundly disclosive nature, this meaningfulization of question rather than doctrinaire response. So in other words, a lot of the, the mourning and the moaning and so forth that you hear, and a lot of what people call emotionalism, wasn't just emotionalism, and you got to watch that because when you start critiquing the quote-unquote emotionalism of the African-American church, you have an implicit normative judgment that assumes the bifurcation of rationality and emotion as characteristic of Western schizophrenia and simply not characteristic of human beings. So you got to watch that. That's tricky. All right, the German ontologist Martin Heidegger's project for the recovery of being began with the analysis of the being who can raise the question of being. Dasein, the being there, which is the human being, is for Heidegger the being who can raise the question of being. Uh, and I'll portill it. Working in the African American context, it seems to me more appropriate to see the Dasein rather as the being for whom being is in question. Not the being who can raise the being, the question of being, but the being for whom to be is to be in question. As the being for whom to be is to be in question. The da or the there of the Dasein is question itself. There ain't no there. We're not there. We're still on the water. The question of being does not issue forth in the binary of finite infinite, but rather opens out into humanity's essentially infinalitude, which is what I prefer to finite infinite, but more infinalitude, which is more consistent with sort of like a field understanding of, of intersubjectivity and human experience. The fundamental ambiguity of being. Dasein becomes Fragensein. The existential significance of coming to terms with death for the purposes of reaching authentic human existence must be understood through death as the reaching uh, authentic, or must be understood death as the ultimate loss of opportunity to be, as the ultimate symbol of our infinalitude. Our fear of death is not of death in itself. It cannot be. We do not know death directly. Death therefore symbolizes something. Our fear of death is rooted in its symbolization of the impossibility of the satisfaction of desire. Desire becomes self-consciousness in our awareness of being in question. Death, therefore, is a symbol of the finality of our infinalitude. We'll never know. Being is essentially indeterminate, and the state of being in question, the ontological condition of the flagenzein of human being. I just use the symbol question because I don't even think you can use the term flagen. It's too definite for me. So I just have question mark zine. Heidegger's formulation of the issues and approach to the meaning of the Dasein seems to me still far too Cartesian and remote. His approach to the Dasein is still far too evocative of the image of a philosopher coolly contemplating an objectified existence already at least once removed from being. Yet I think that Heidegger's project for the recovery of being is precisely to the point. But the recovery of being is no mere academic philosophical exercise. The recovery of being is sui generis, the quest of homo religiosus. The recovery of being is precisely the religious quest. It is the quest of the being for whom being is in question. Heidegger's quest for being emerges out of an authentic religious impulse. I think this accounts for his later turn. In fact, he refers to his project as a second religiousness. The religious quest is fundamentally the response of the being for whom to be is to be in question. 
Heidegger's quest for the recovery of being, in light of what he calls Western man's forgetfulness of being, is essentially a symptom of the rootlessness of modernity and a European culture shaken out of its world by the overwhelming forces of enlightenment, the subsequent shocks and numerous aftershocks of the scientific revolution and shuns and recurrent social upheaval. Prior to this, being was not so much forgotten as taken for granted. To put it another way, a being could, not, could only be forgotten in the take-it-for-granted nature of a worldview grounded in the unquestioning atmosphere of deep spiritual presuppositions. The very realization of the forgetfulness of being is at once the discovery that being could be and is therefore implicitly, if it could be, is in question. So once you don't wake up from that dogmatic slumber, you can't go back. That's why fundamentalisms in the modern world are of a peculiar nature and cannot be identified with traditional religions of the pre-modern era. The recovery is a response to the realization of being in question. It triggers the longing for being. The Dasein is thrown da or there, but where is there? It is questioned, indeed, in question itself. The Middle Passage threw the Africans and their world into question and awoke them from their dogmatic slumber giving them an earlier and more intense form of the shock of modernity and thus granting them the dubious distinction by making them, I think, the paradigmatic figure and key to understanding the tragical, trauma-prone humanity we see in postmodernity. That means there's a reason why black culture appears to the rest of the world, because it's rooted in a malady that we all share by being children of modernity, and it has produced a kind of antidotal response. That's why we like to hear Marvin Gaye sell soap suds. Makes absolutely no sense, but we all feel better when we hear it. There's a reason for that. I'm saying that that appeal is not incidental. There's a real reason for that. It's just not entertainment value. It's speaking to something profound. All right. Much, that's why I said trauma-prone humanity we see in post-modernity. Much of the provocative philosophical force and spiritual power and tragedy comes from its inherent ambiguity. The suffering and tragedy raises questions that the denouement never answers. There is no, that's why you can't go with this resolution of conflict and so forth that you see in Aristotle and Hegel and others. It just, just simply is not there. Once you raise those questions, the skunk's on the table, the cat's out of the bag. You can't, you can't end them by ending the story. There is no closure at the heart of tragedy. Not at the end of the story, but at the heart of tragedy. Tragedy leaves life in question. Tragedy presents the stark and dangerous tensions inherent in human existence, colliding and producing ruinous fates. As far as the individuals who suffer are concerned, the characters with which we are compelled to identify, the denouement is never reparative. There are no resurrections of any kind. The hallmark of tragedy is ambiguity. The power of tragedy is in the aesthetic transfiguration of life's dark side that allows us to engage it look upon it and even embrace it without the necessity of falsifying or denying it. That was the brilliance of African-American traditional religious consciousness, right? Because we were allowed to talk about our suffering and recognize it. So in other words, we sang it and talked about it in such a way we were able to own that it was there, which is a necessary precondition for dealing with it. Whereas now, in many of the, the forms of, of liturgy and preaching and teaching and singing that you see in many black churches now that have been subject to this prosperity stuff that we're going to talk about tomorrow, they are in a constant state of denial. They have become exactly the opposite of what the black church is. And calling it black church all the time just causes noisy. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Being noisy is not an essential characteristic of black worship. There's a difference between noise and music. Okay? Sound and shouting is, is a difference because there's different noise that means something and noise that's nonsensical. There's a difference. And I think we can make that distinction without losing who we are as a, a, a distinct form of worship in the black church. All right. The power of tragedy is, is its aesthetic transfiguration of life's dark side. The aesthetic transformation that suffering undergoes in the tragic transfiguration affirms a depth of meaning in the midst of ruin. So you still recognize the ruin. All right? And, and you, you go to these prosperity churches, they're in the middle of the ghetto. And they act like it ain't even there. They even got the people who are suffering in the ghetto walking to church on Sunday morning trying to look and smile like they ain't in pain. And it ain't a smile, it's a grimace. All right. An affirmation of life in the tragic. You see, an affirmation of depth of meaning in the midst of ruin, an affirmation of life 
a hope that transcends but lends power to all hopes. So in other words, a deep structural reality that then lends power to little individual hopes. But the deep structural reality precedes little individual hopes and subsequently actually precedes any particular form of religious expression. I think it's ontologically prior. Maybe historically prior, maybe historically identical, but it's ontologically prior. In other words, it's deeper than any creedal affirmation of any religious faith. That's why it's consistent with the theological unconscious of the black church, which may or may not be the same um, as what somebody may consciously give you if you ask them what they believe. Okay, which is part of the problem with, with, with Cohn's criterion of truth, being that the black church accepts it. If that was the criterion of truth, we'd be in big trouble right about now. Okay. Now, let me see. Okay, all right, I mean, the meaningfulness of life becomes the worthwhileness of life. In other words, once we experience it as valuable through the art, then life is experienced as worthwhile. In other words, the ruin is transvalued, and you get the strength to go on. That's why things like keep on keeping on and I feel like going on really begin to make very profound sense, okay? It's not just some kind of naked, brutal strength. It's facilitated by some very hard cultural work that's produced on a regular basis in the work of prayer meeting and testimony and preaching and singing on Sunday. That's hard culture, producing resources to go on. Okay, so there's a production process going on there. That's why you just, it's just not a liturgical form. So if you superficialize it as that, you miss the whole point. You miss what it tells us about humanity under conditions of the rest and extremity which has been a fundamental theme throughout Western literature, from Moby Dick to Joseph uh, Conrad to, to uh, Zora Neale Hurston, there, to the Invisible Man, uh, to, to the philosophical writings of Carl Jaspers. Men and women under conditions of extremity. What is the human being? You see what he is or she is under conditions of extremity. And in, in the African-American religious experience, you get a very magnified view. That's why it's to all of our detriment not to study it far more closely than we traditionally have or to prematurely moralize it by just calling it suffering. All right, the fundamental aesthetic element effuses the experience of suffering with an irreducible experience of value. So the aesthetic is key. Now, you, that's why black folks sing. It ain't cause we're happy, okay? The experience of, su it infuses, the aesthetic infuses the experience of suffering with an irreducible experience of value. Irreducible. An experience that needs no explanation or discursive articulation. It's there. It makes me feel more whole, worthwhile, valuable. Okay? It may, it's fundamental. The power to lift and transfigure is in the irreducible experience of the aesthetic moment itself, although it cannot be separated from the content in and through which it makes itself felt. By its power, life is rendered worthwhile. It is from the fundamental starting point, the starting point, that the power to hope begins. So you take away my song, you take away my hope. So you destroy my traditional religious experience. What you're going to see is a great deal of cynicism, nihilism, and despair in the black community, and you're seeing it. Yeah, it's important. The power to formulate particular hopes is drawn from this fundamental transfiguration, which is at heart the affirmation and at the same time the perception of the worst worthwhileness of life. This is why, listen, we still, listen, evangelism and the church is still a necessary component to people's salvation in oppressed communities. So trashing Christianity, I think, is a bad idea, particularly before you understand the version of Christianity that you actually have. You're throwing away, not only the baby with the bathwater, you're, you're throwing away the goose and the egg yeah, that's right. before you even understood what they were. This death affirmation of being infused the African Americans daily struggle with meaning. The preservation of this fundamental dimension of the meaningfulness or worthwhileness of life was a necessary precondition for the meaningfulness of any other kind of stru struggle. That's why you cannot separate what they call conservative, traditional church from progressive church. It is, the, it is the very, is the necessary condition for making any kind of decision is what's provided in the liturgical forms of what they call conservative Christianity. And the two are always mixed. The same people that listened to J.H. Jackson also shouted for King. It wasn't because they were stupid. It was because they were, what they were experiencing was deeper than the implicit ideological conflicts. Yeah. 
That's what we have to understand. Once you get to that level, then you begin to understand that layer of African-American religious experience that should signify theologically. Okay. Beyond, otherwise, you just reduce an African-American theology basically to a thinly veiled form of social ethics anyhow. All right. The preservation of this fundamental dimension of the meaningfulness of the world this life was a necessary precondition. Many commentators on African-American religion have misidentified an inclination to passivity in what they misread as a fatalistic vision inherent in what I identify as a fundamentally tragic spirituality and vision. Sewell writes insightfully of tragedy. Nor is a tragic vision, quote, nor is a tragic vision for those who admitting unresolved questions and the reality of guilt anxiety and suffering would become quietist and do nothing. So in other words, we don't have to act like, this is what people understand about, about African Americans. We don't have, in mass, we don't have to act like America's perfect in order to experience hopefulness in the struggle to make it better. We don't have to lie to ourselves about America's pristine past in order to see hope in America's future, nor should we be required to do so. It is simply inconsistent with our experience and everybody else's. The tragic vision impels the man or, should, well, he's using uh, man or, or, or woman, of action to fight against destiny, kick against the pricks, and state his cause before God or his fellows, which is what we've traditionally done. It impels the artist in his fictions toward what Carl Jaspers calls boundary situations, humans at the limits of their sovereignty, Job on his ash heap, Prometheus on a crag, Oedipus in his moment of self-discovery, Lear on the heath, Ahab on his lonely quarter deck, and may I add, the African on the auction block, praying in her bush harbor or languishing in a death-ridden cargo hall. Here, with all the protective covering stripped off, the hero faces as if no man or woman had ever faced it before, the existential question, Job's question, what is man? or Leah's is man no more than this. Okay. The process was, in many respects, the aesthetic process of the black liturgy, uh, radically reparative. The inherent dialectic present in both word and song could and still can be witnessed in what seems to some observers the inexplicable mood swing from the mournfully plaintive rhythmic expressions to an equally rhythmic but often frenzied celebration. I hate that word celebration. That we, we, we inherited that from the Pentecostals. That quite, wasn't quite what it was. The celebratory swing was, is not the glib hope and the superficial joy some observers and increasingly some participants have made of it. But at root and always already tragic celebration of a meaningfulness of life amidst its ruins. Not in the absence of its ruins. African-American religious experience reflects at its core what Paul Tillich identified as the courage to be. Note the thick family resemblance to Vernant and Vital Nequette's discussion of tragic consciousness. Quote, but it is not only the world of myth that loses its consistency and dissolves in this focus. By the same token, the world of the city is called into question and its fundamental values are challenged in the ensuing debate. When exalting the civic ideal and affirming its victory over all forces from the past, even Aeschylus, the most optimistic of the tragic writers, seems not to be making a positive declaration with tranquil conviction, but rather to be expressing a hope, making an appeal that remains full of anxiety, even amidst the joy of the final apotheosis, end quote. The rhythmic churning in the plaintive minor key that so often characterized the sorrow songs and black traditional gospel was the heart and blues was the hard work of transfiguration that manufactured existential resources to cope and mend. As Christianity made its way into the slave huts and plantation life, the paradigmatic personages, symbols, stories, myths of the Bible appropriated in and as fragments became an essential source of raw material. They provided the straw for the bricks out of which African-Americans would construct new dwellings for a new and tragic cosmosing. Not cosmos, cosmosing, because it's ongoing. Cosmos is too static a concept, doesn't capture the nature of the process and the essential processual nature of the experience. A cosmos where longing, fragmentation, and ambiguity were the prevailing reality. In the African-American experience, any effective religious experience was one that facilitated life amidst ambiguity, meaningful living amidst unanswered questions. 
Its proximity to the existential necessity encouraged both its vitality and its authenticity. In other words, its, its experience near nature. That's what I talk about in my book, that it's experienced near. That's what vouchsafes its vitality and authenticity, not some raw, naked emotionalism of the, of the passionate, primitive Negro. The fact that it was so close to what they were actually experiencing, not some essential characteristic of, the, of primitive man. The chronic nature of the African-American predicament paradoxically provided for the stability that encouraged the evolution and refinement of the experience that coalesced in a unique tradition and the birth of African-American Christian consciousness, which now you see could not, therefore, be fundamentally the same as white evangelical Southerners. All right. In many ways, a systematic study of the phenomenon of getting happy, as it was called when I first experienced it growing up in the black church, New Jersey and rural Virginia and Chicago and, and, and South Carolina, and which Du Bois referred to as a frenzy, would help disclose many of the essential dynamics of African-American Christian consciousness. Um, how much more time? Am I out of time yet? Okay. I'm, I want to talk about the frenzy to shout, because that's one of the most misunderstood things and one of the most abused words in black religious ethos, to shout. People really think shouting is yelling, just yelling. And the way that happened is we, many, many of us, the black people, as well as white folk, have internalized white people's imposition of the valuelessness of the experience on the experience. So before we even understood what shouting was, we started acting out the stereotype of what the larger culture told us we were doing. In other words, we have become a caricature of ourselves. And that's, that's a very unfortunate thing to become. All right. I have worked it out more carefully elsewhere, yet it is such an important aspect of the experience that I must say a word about it here. In the experience of the frenzy, the shout, the intra-psychic tensions that resulted from the refractory socialization of the African American that we talked about earlier into the warped cultural taxonomy of a racist culture were negotiated in the hyperliminal experience of the shout. Those tensions were worked out in the shout. And, it, and you can see it now. We talk about work it out, we talk about walk it out. It's the same stuff. In the liminal experience, the cultural taxonomy or the refracted internalized definitions of black being. In fact, all social distinctions, if we can trust Victor Turner, and I tend to trust him theoretically, undergo a meltdown freeing the individual of the stressed and stress-ridden intrapsychic tensions, creating at the same time communitas, a state where distinctions wither away in a sense of oneness. In the experience, the subject undergoes a euphoric experience of wholeness and well-being. The as-if nature of the experience, experience in the subjunctive sense, provides a centering moment in which the state of freedom, not defined exclusively or even predominantly in political and economic terms, as experienced vicariously in its reality or more accurately, the reality of its possibility becomes affirmed. So you got a whole lot going on in the shout. You have the freedom, in other words, you escape the intrapsychic tensions by which your, your sense of self has been constituted, what Du Bois simplistically called the two-ness. I call it the sporagmus, because you divide it in more than two ways. And we divide it more than vertically and horizontally. What happens is in the shout, all that melts away. And for a moment, you are free of constraint, which is manifested in the bodily participation, that's why the body is so extremely important a part of understanding what African American religion is. Okay? So that's what happens in the shout. When that gets set loose, and when that gets set loose, it's, it's analogous, it's analogous to a chain reaction. Nuclear power getting set loose. And if you've ever been in church when it happens, and don't be preaching because you might have to duck, because it throws something at you. If you've ever been in church when that happens, it moves like a chain reaction. This now, this other stuff, the shout on demand, is not, I'm not talking about that. So if y'all cut on the television Sunday morning and see this stuff, I'm not talking about, you know, start off in fourth gear and then slam on the brakes when service is over. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about. Nor was that what it was, nor was that what it is. And it's most authentic expression. I know I'm using normative language, but I think I can, I can defend, defend the case. All right. So we, we have that. In the liminal experience, the cultural taxonomy that's refracted goes away. Now, the eschatological moment implicated in the experience, because you're living as if 
you're free, even when you're not. That is an inherently eschatological moment. That's the as if. When we all get to heaven, we're going to put on our shoes and walk all over God's heaven. The eschatological moment implicated in the experience lent itself naturally to a utopian sensibility that prevailed throughout African-American Christian consciousness, which then provided the substratum of spirituality for the so-called progressives who had dreams. It's the same reality. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. Oh, I want to argue. The utopian sensibility, as I have called it, found its quintessential symbolic expression in the notion of heaven and crystallized in what some have identified over simplistically as a counterproductive otherworldliness. This has led some black theologians mistakenly to identify a fundamental bifurcation in African-American Christian consciousness between a conservative otherworldly orientation and a progressive thisworldly orientation toward political liberation. And that distinction, by the way, is a very Western way of seeing it, which I always found amusingly ironic. <laughs> this mistaken identification has caused a premature conflation of theological reflection and social ethics. There is a more fundamental unity in African-American Christian consciousness, religious experience, the examination of which provides for a fuller, richer theology than traditional black theology has yet to provide. When one considers African-American Christian consciousness as a resource for theological reflection, this experience, properly understood, suggests a radical reconsideration for, every, for the church, period, of the traditional categories of Christian theology and the way key symbols and concepts are configured, particularly in the African-American context. There is a theological unconsciousness in the African-American Christian tradition which has to do with the implications of the underlying structure of the experience. I use the term implication because I see theology as already implicit in or certainly suggested by the experience. The Christian faith as it was presented to African Americans underwent a transvaluation and a consequence of the conditions in which it was encountered and under which it was appropriated. In an effort to understand the theological implications of African American Christian consciousness, I'm hermeneutically privileging their response wherein African Americans were forced by existential exigencies to react to circumstances that threatened their psychic survival and the worthwhileness of life. The central and always already related elements in the experience that call for a radical reconsideration of traditional Christian theology are one, its fragmentary nature, two, its distinctly tragic flavor, three, its utopian sensibility, and four, the instantiation of the interrogative state exacerbated by chronic marginalization and characterized by a persistent and tenacious longing as the authentic response to the fundamentally ambiguous nature of human existence disclosed in the particularity of African-American Christian consciousness. Now, now that, that part is key. When we consider the primary symbols of the Christian faith in the context of African-American Christian consciousness, I am led to decenter the resurrection replacing it with a polarity established by the paradigmatic events of crucifixion slash resurrection on one end and the second coming. With the second coming replacing the resurrection as a primary Christological moment and focus of faith. You have to descend to the resurrection because you're not, going to, uh, you're not going to have a realistic reflection in your Christian faith of what's really going on in the world if you keep privileging the resurrection and like that's the end of the story. Because I, I, I'm just not, I'm not, I'm not getting that. I'm catching hell. So I got to force myself into a false consciousness to embrace this resurrection thing during worship, which is just okay for that eschatological moment, keeps the hope of freedom alive. But I got to return to catching hell when I leave. My faith has to help me with that. All right. The persistent longing, the chronic desire, characteristic of the Dasein's infinalitude, looks out of the horror of Calvary, the finality of infinalitude, past the resurrection, relegated to a penultimate theological significance, to the second coming. It sublates the resurrection, which secures only the determination of the Zaya, a determination captured in the familiar phrase, keep on keeping on. The resurrection is not the desire's full fulfillment. Promise sustains desire. It does not end, foreclose, or fulfill it. Therefore, only in the unfulfilled promise of the second coming does desire come to rest or more accurately locate, albeit uneasily, as its most adequate symbolic representation. It is the primary Christological category. The second coming, however, is deeply problematized because it is an unfulfilled promise, perhaps even as I prefer to see it, a broken promise and a cracked symbol. 
To understand the second coming in terms of an actual historical occurrence is to miss the real meaning of the symbol and in fact falsifies his claim to ultimacy. The insistence on the second coming as a definite historical occurrence to take place at some in principle specifiable point in time amounts to an inauthentication of the desire that is truly humanizing by transforming it into a demand and by transfixing its flow in into a closed symbol. Now I'm reading him through Lacan. I'm reading the second coming right here through Lacan. The Medusan gaze of literality, more to the point in this sense, literal temporality, transfixes the life of desire into a frozen symbol hardened into a stony doctrinalism that leads to a kind of passivity and inactivity that eventually crumbles into a false and defensive consciousness or a bad faith. Whereas if left free-flowing to imbue life with a meaningful future, it facilitates the meaningful living of and struggling through actual life. It is instructive here to follow Casey and Woody's reading of Lacan and the employment of Kojev. I'll spare you that. The broken promise of the second coming is the last shining fragment of the faith in the post-Christian era. It is something of the will of the wisp and the swampy reaches of humanity's foreseeable offing, ever encouraging us on one generation after the other toward a shimmering somewhere only glimpsed through the misty flats. It focuses the longing but does not obliterate it. In fact, it intensifies the longing and the desire. The unfulfilled promise is Janus faced in that it reflects all the other broken promises that accrue as a result of human failings. The great promises of nations, of religions, that fall miserably short of their intended goals. The expression of that something more for which we are forever reaching but ever unable to grasp it is the big broken promise that nevertheless keeps all brokenness meaningful. It is the tragic expression of the gap between humankind's reach and its grasp that nevertheless sustains the meaningfulness of the reaching itself. The symbol remains potent because of the fundamental ambiguity. It mediates meaning in the threat of meaninglessness, but in its mediation it never loses the openness or the mark of its participation in the ambiguity. This is the reality encountered in the symbol. It is the reality of the symbol. It is its potency and power. Being speaks in and through the symbol. It communicates meaning precisely because of its ambiguity being a constituent moment in the articulation of meaning. The interplay of meaning and ambiguity is much like the indeterminacy discovered at the heart of quantum reality. The attempts to fix the location and motion of a subatomic particle is impossible, but the structuration of reality requires the living activity of the same simultaneously. Symbolic reality captures that in the living experience of the symbol, but any attempt to fix its position in time in terms of historical fulfillment leads to reality of broken promise, while if left unfixed in terms of historical existence and living faith leads to the authentic encounter of a profoundly meaningful life amidst ambiguity deeply imbued with personal meaning and promise. The broken promise of the, of the second coming is the expression of both the reality of human existence and the tragic reality of God who really is a cosmic desire in itself that in the desiring lifts and ennobles life, driving, drawing it ever on to higher reaches, but tragically implicated in the pain and failure of authentic attainment. A longing made poignant by pain and suffering. The desire and the pain are necessary conditions of each other in a creative tension that drives the act of creation, sustaining transfiguration, constituting an essential dim dimension of the divine itself. It is the expression of the primordial contradiction, which is God and beyond the judgment, usually associated with contradiction, and indeed beyond the traditional understanding of goodness and evil as categories, finding justification only in the depth of tragic wisdom and understanding expressed in and through the aesthetic. Redemption is the transfiguration of life expressed through humanity's reach and what the reaching does in and for human life, and it constitutes both the goodness and power of God. It is act, acting, always having happened, but of necessity always happening or in act. The being of God is not expressed in the not yet, nor even in the gap between the now and the not yet, but rather in the gap between the now and the what may never be. The expression of the longing or desire itself is the expression of the eternal. The rehearsal of it and the affirmation of its inherent aspiration is what we call worship. This is not a counsel of despair in closing as some may be quick to judge, but the qualities of a tragic and heroic faith. It is the challenge of the cross and the meaning of Jesus of Nazareth's last words. It is the tragic depths of personal existence, human and divine, and their meeting place, the cross. 
African-American experience betrays its participation in modernity from the underside as we experience which parallels the thinking of other postmodern precursors such as Nietzsche. For in both Nietzsche's work, particularly in the implicit death of God in the text, implicit in the text birth of tragedy, and the African-American experience, we see the death of God as a sterile theological concept and lifeless, morally degenerate faith tradition and the reemergence of the divine as a dynamic reality. The stale god of classical theism and traditional Western Christianity was murdered in modernity, but something deeper and richer and in the end truer emerged. The tragic and courageous faith is the highest expression of the religious religion of the cross. Thank you. <laughs>